Um, welcome. This session is called The Art of a Sustainable Future. And my name is Christopher Breedlove. And, you know, I have really the, the privilege these days of working with an organization called the Burning Man Project. And I think that Burning Man is often known for a temporary city, an event that we host in the northern Nevada desert called Black Rock City. When, when we have this event, it's 80,000 people coming together, and we actually end up creating the fourth largest city in Nevada for that one week of temporary time. And it is a communal and art-filled experience that is a lot of different things to a lot of different people. I often say there's 80,000 people who come to Burning Man, and that means there's 80,000 different descriptions of what Burning Man is. But I think a less known fact about what Burning Man is, is that we are also a, a non-for-profit organization. And uh, that non-for-profit is called Burning Man Project. And you know, throughout the year, we focus on supporting arts, on supporting civics, on supporting events, and most recently, kind of a, a foray into land projects and sustainability, particularly out in the northern Nevada desert. And so while I'm, I'm going to keep on giving an intro for a moment, I just want to say that today I'm going to be joined by uh, Zach Siriavelo uh, from the Fly Ranch Project, as well as Colin O'Donnell and Dusty Michael, who are finalists in our design challenge. And I'm just going to invite you guys to come up on stage with me if you want. I'm going to give a little bit more of an intro, but welcome. Come, come on up here. And I think kind of just to do a, a little bit more. Hey, guys. Um, just to do just a teeny bit more um, context setting but before we kind of dive into this project, as I was saying, right, is that, you know, Burning Man Project, we're, we're really looking at, at how we support our community's endeavors out in the world. And, you know, there are a few tenants uh, that I think are, are very much a part of, of Burning Man. And I think that the three I'd like to call in for the moment, oh, and I think I lost Zach. So hopefully, Zach, if you need to press there, we go doing this live, but I was going to say the three tenants that I think are really important about Burning Man Project from my experience is one is the art. And so art is, is a big part of the experience that we bring together. The second is really around kind of this idea of radical self-reliance. And so as we go out into the city uh, in the middle of the desert and create this city, we need to learn as individuals about how to create the types of communities, the types of buildings, the types of technologies that we need to uh, survive in the desert. And so there's a lot of skill building that happens in that, particularly with infrastructure. And then that third part that I want to kind of bring in is this idea of leave no trace. We have 10 principles within the Burning Man project. And for most people, if you've looked at our, our culture, that means that we build the city and then we you know, clean it all up and we leave the desert as pristine as we had found it. But when you actually look into that wordage of leave no trace, how we describe it, we also say that whenever possible, we endeavor to leave the place better than we found it. And so it's those three kind of streams that I just described together right here, that art, that infrastructure, and that idea of sustainability that kind of came together to, to bring together this talk and, and, and these speakers with you today. And we really want to kind of explore how Burning Man is, is moving into a more permanent sort of world and ideally starting to bring together the art and the fun that can be sustainability as climate change uh, obviously is going to be something on all of our minds. So first, I want to bring up Zachary. Uh, Zach, uh, thanks for joining us today. And I would love for you to maybe kind of root us in, you know, who are you and tell us about what, what Fly Ranch uh is. Thank you very much, Christopher. Pleasure to be here, and, and thanks to everyone for joining us. Um, uh, so my name is Zach Cervello. I'm the operations manager for Fly Ranch. And Fly Ranch is when Burning Man started making their, their foray into becoming a nonprofit, one of the things that they set up that they wanted to do was the establishment of a rural center. So in 2016, um, with the helpful support of some wonderful donors, we were able to acquire 3,800 acres uh, of high desert, about 24 miles north of Gerlach, Nevada, which is where I'm calling in from now. Um, and set out on imagining what it might look like to have a year-round regenerative site for this creative culture. Um, and so really one of the first things that we did for the first year as a base was just sit and, and watch the land. Um, it's a pretty dynamic property. 
Um, but it's also a property that has had a lot of uses in its past. It's been a former uh, Alpha Alpha homestead, um, and it's been an event site. Birdie Man 1997 was actually held there. It was the only time it was on private land. Uh, it was about 10,000 people. So we spent about a year just living with this site, understanding it. Um, we deployed an environmental fellow that gave us a great baseline of where there are invasive species, what birds are migrating through, and gave us a really wonderful, robust set of uh, data for uh, weather, sun, relative humidity, things like that, throughout different zones of the property. We took that and we uh, started a relationship with a group called the Land Art Generator Initiative. They have done design challenges for about the last 10 years in places like uh, Dubai, et cetera, um, Venice, and uh, have historically done design competitions for works of art that generate power. And we got together with them and we said, let's take the same format and template and look at solutions for power, water, shelter, food systems, and regenerative technology. And we opened up 280 acres of a corridor of the site for submissions. Um, released all the information and data that we had about the site. And then in true kind of Burning Man fashion said to the community in an open source model, what are your ideas? What do you got? Um, we've, we've got some honorary seed funding that we can provide to help build some prototypes. Um, and we want to put it out to the sort of collective, uh, beautiful knowledge of everyone out there. Um, through that, we got several hundred submissions that were vetted by about 200 technical experts, um, about 33 jurors. Uh, who represent a, a, a wide range of, of constituencies. Um, and we have just now gotten to the point of having our finalists, which is a very exciting time. This, this project has been a couple of years in the works now. And so at this point, we have 52 shortlisted teams, um, all of whom were in a conversation on some level about how to start to uh, build or prototype their projects on site. But we also have 10 finalists that were those whom the technical experts and the jurors said, these are the things that represent um, the, the pinnacle of what we're trying to pursue here. This, this um, integration, as Bradlow was saying, about, uh, about art and the space and, and regenerative ideas to create something really uh, inspiring that can also be used uh, as a site. Um, I'm, I'm happy to have here with us uh, two members of teams that were finalists in this design challenge where, you know, it's a really exciting time for us to uh, start to engage in some, some beautiful ideas. And I, I would sort of love for, for Dusty and Colin to have the opportunity to introduce their projects and have them tell you about it and, and not me. Um, maybe start with Dusty, we can share a little bit about uh, Coyote Mountain. You're still on mute, Dusty. Okay. So yeah, Coyote Mountain. Um... It's essentially a topographic structure. Uh, looking at the build sites available on Fly Ranch, there was this one sort of off to the side, kind of lonely looking little place that the, just the shape of the where the sagebrush was reminded me of the shape of a coyote jumping into the air, which is with how they hunt. And um, I had previously thought, well, if I was going to build something at Fly Ranch, I would want to make sure that you couldn't really see it because it's the, the environment is, is really awfully grand and austere. So I just sort of hit upon the idea of having building a mountain that from the ground just blends into the landscape behind it, blends into the Calico Range behind it. But that when you're um, flying over it, you know, in orbit, it looks like a coyote and it's in the shape of a coyote. And I also so thought, well, let's uh, looking at topographic maps. I'm going to make that coyote with, you know, like every 20 feet, it's going to have a different elevation. So it's a little hard to describe, but um, we have a video somewhere that that you can uh, sort of get the idea of what it looks like. But the idea is that it's 250,000 square feet of um, enclosed uh, space, climate controlled, because it's very hot and very cold and very windy in this environment. Uh, almost something is irritating all the time. And what we really want is to bring, what I really want is to bring hundreds of people together full time for artists, studios, and 
um, classrooms and conference space, library, uh, greenhouses, living quarters. So basically what I'm proposing, me and my team, we have a very small team, um, we're proposing basically a small town under glass. It's, it's got a skin of clear solar glass. It's got a wind tunnel on the first floor filled with bladeless turbines. And those are two of the, the three things that Fly Ranch has in abundance, wind and sun. But the third one, geothermal, is going to be the workhorse. That's where we're mostly going to generate the power to run this very large facility, frankly. And um, I wanted to use off-the-shelf technology so that we can get it done and uh, get it working. Uh, it's, uh, it only looks like a sculpture from the air. Uh, from, the, from the ground, it looks like a mountain. And uh, yeah, we need a lot of help with it, though. So we're, we're just in the schematic section, the schematic point in time on our project. So. I think that's an overview. Wonderful, thank you, Dusty. Um, and Colin is here representing Seed. Um, we're in full Seed Symbiotic Coalition, I believe. Yeah, um, one of the amazing things about this project is you know, you're kind of working in the dark and then you submit and then a month or several months later, you get to see everyone's projects. You're like, wow, we were thinking similar things. So it's really exciting to see. Dusty's thoughts and sort of where they converge and, and um, kind of the common themes that um, I think a lot of people are thinking about. So yeah, we looked at um, Fly Ranch and we've been up there and, and spent some time on the land. Um, we were um, you know, blown away by the natural beauty of the place and thought you know, we can't, we don't want to disrupt this in a very similar way as, as Dusty was thinking, like how do we, build buildings that are really in harmony with the place. But we were also thinking about, um, we were thinking about what is the art that we're gonna bring here? You know, there's five systems that uh, Laggy and Burning Man were looking for, um, any number of them that we could propose. So it was power, shelter, water, uh, waste, uh, food production. And we thought as soon as we're gonna start doing one thing, we're gonna start doing all of them. So. And we, we decided right in the beginning that, you know, if we're going to make food, we're going to make waste. So we should think about how all these systems work together um, and how they work together in the land. And then we were thinking about climate change and increase of desertification and thinking about regeneration as being so critical that how could we create a system that greened the desert and that made it, you know, that a city that could grow and and the more it grew, the greener and richer it got, not the more junk that it produced or the more asphalt it, it produced. Um, so we, and we've, we've been working on kind of ephemeral urbanism kind of ideas, the idea that cities can grow and shrink and that people can, can leave and come on a, a residency or come for work or come to learn something and, and move around. So we, we thought our art is going to be community as art and building a beautiful community and that this is really just a container for that. And so we want to create the right conditions for a city to emerge or for a, a community to emerge, to, um, to have scholars, to have um, thinkers come together in a place to learn, to exchange ideas. And that's why we called it Seed is we really wanted this to be a place where we could plant something and have it grow. So our, our built environment is from the earth. Um, the dirt in the area, the playa, is actually this incredibly fine clay. Uh, it goes 100 feet deep in a lot of places. Um, just really beautiful um, building material. So we envision convolted uh, rooms of fired clay, of mechanically stabilized earth, of various earth building techniques coming together. This has a benefit of um, I'm sure a lot of people know of keeping the environment at a relatively stable 50 degrees or so. So we'd scoop out earth from one location and build up in another. And so the, where we scooped out, we proposed uh, pit based agriculture, which has been used for millennia in desert climates to kind of protect a growing area from, from the wind and from uh, so much sun and provide a little microclimate. And so we'd use that, 
that it was kind of this beautiful sine wave that we were, were looking at where we'd scoop out in one place and build up in the other. And we started to realize that looked a bit like a sand dune. And so we thought, well, what if we could make this city? That's it, kind of like earth ships and hot springs look like sand dunes and, and just be a place where people could come up uh, potentially, you know, as we're moving towards a mobile, uh, a mobile world in an electric autonomous camper van, plug into kind of stretch some canvas over their their uh, little pot of vehicles, so they're they're disguised from the landscape and providing shade, and then having access to communal facilities, kitchens, baths, uh, studio spaces, convening halls. So that's um, you know the proposal has so many different parts from the built environment, the food production. Uh, the waste, so things like biodigesters we're, we're really interested in. So we're definitely looking for help from experts in uh, natural building systems, uh, you know, waste management, uh, regeneration, power. So I think this is just a beautiful convening that uh, Burning Man has, has spiked here and, and just inspired a bunch of people to come together. So we're a small team that's come together. We're looking to build a bigger team to get on site and start actually feeling this out and uh, and and seeing how the prototype comes together. So thanks. Wonderful. Thank you both very much. Um, a, a note on sort of where we are at in the process that um, both your projects, and I want to commend you on this, have thought about a lot of systems at once. Um, and that's really beautiful. I think it's part of the reason that the, the jurors were so supportive of them. and in, in um, being in those those top 10 finalists. There's also, uh, I wanna do a plug for the 52 finalist projects that are out there. And I believe Christopher has put the link uh, to all of the shortlisted proposals in the chat. And I would encourage people to go out there because they're, you know, they run the gamut from these large, um, you know, stacking systems, um, dynamic space design to a, a small solar chicken coop or things like that. And, you know, we're not at the conclusion of a process, really, at the, we're at the start of a process where um, there are all these teams and all these ideas that are now out publicly and people can put their comments or if you see something that you like, people can get involved or, or sign up and help. We're going to be working on uh, like a, a summer camp for Loggy teams to be able to come out and start to intermingle and combine projects. And we're at this really interesting point where now we have these really incredible ideas generated and we could sort of enter into the, the social aspect of seeing you know, who wants to collaborate and work together, what technologies can be shared across systems, you know, the integrating into the site and doing the site design is where we're at now. And it's a really exciting time for us and for anyone out there that may be interested in getting involved to just go through that list of shortlisted projects. Like this looks really cool. I have this idea or I want to help or have you thought of that? Uh, and I would just invite people to do this. It's still, still quite an open process. You know, Zach, I want to ask you one quick question because I think that uh, sometimes for those of us who spent a lot of time out in the northern Nevada desert, we're instantly transported there. Um, and so just real quick, kind of helping us kind of get into place real quick. You know, can you tell us how far away is is Fly from Reno? What's the size of the town of Gerlach? And also, like, maybe what's the scale of the, the site? And then I want to jump back to Dusty and Colin and talk about kind of influences. Yeah, I won't, just wanted to um, do this in place question. for a moment. So the property of Flash is uh, it's located about two hours and change north of Reno. Uh, it's 24 miles north of Gerlach, a small town you hit along the way. This is an old mining town um, or an old railroad town. It used to be owned by the railroad company. Right now, there's a population that fluctuates of about it's about 120, maybe 130. Um, uh, that that typically swells around the event production season for for Black Rock City Burning Man, um, but for the most part, it's this uh, small little desert outpost uh, hamlets where I am right now. It's it's lovely, um, but it's also in the middle of a high desert, and there's environmental factors to consider. It's generally we we sort of joke around with people. You know, it's either going to be really hot or really cold or really windy um, or very dusty. Um, and you've sort of got to contend with those in environmental factors. The property itself is about one and a half miles by about four miles. It's kind of a long strip that crests the Wallapai Flat, which is a dried lake bed, similar to where we produce the Black Rock City event, although much smaller. Um, sort of breaks into to three major sections. The southernmost section is um, 
rangelands and sagebrush um, and about 120 acres of that playa that I was talking about. It's also where the site of Black Rock City was held in 1997. The middle section is where the homestead was, the old alfalfa field, really sort of heavily impacted area um, along water channel ditch um, where you have the um, open valley to your east and then this mountain range to your to your west and then the northern section of the property is a robust and complex uh, hot spring system where there are uh, hundreds of, of pools that are there ranging from small we we'll call hot holes that are the size of dinner plates to very large uh, beautiful hot spring soaking ponds that are there and available um, and you know one of the things that we put out to solve for in Lagi is around water. And so we started getting some interesting things about how to utilize that geothermal activity. It's quite an abundant resource that, as Dusty pointed out. Um, and we were excited to see people lean into that a little bit. Cool, thanks Zach. I just think, again, I, I think it's important to kind of understand that that landscape. I wanna push it over uh, to Dusty for a moment. and. You know, Dusty, you know, you're someone who, who, from my experience, has actually been, for a lot of your life, rooted very in, in technology. Um, and, you know, this installation is, is very physical, you know, in a lot of ways. And obviously, it, it has technological aspects. But, you know, I'm kind of curious, like, what, why, why now do something like this? You know, like, especially as I think, you know, we're moving into the multiverse in, in a lot of ways. I mean, I'm curious why why you were inspired to well, build something I think physical. And, peculiarly, and even though I have been in the forefront of technology most of my life from, you know, the dawn of personal computer to the dawn of the Internet, um, I think I'm over that and done with that. And I have... Uh, recently, well, more and more frequently thought, you know, the lights are going to go out one of these days, and we've become too dependent upon that stuff. So my concern really is the survival of Burning Man culture, which I think is a very important worldview that contains all worldviews. And I, I think we're, we're going to have, uh, we'll be in a world of hurt if we go down a very uh, rigid way of looking at the world and you know predetermining how to solve our problems before we even know what those problems are so i'm i'm looking at a place to save burning man culture essentially for me sustainability means being off grid and not dependent upon the what we call the default world for our survival uh, I want a, a laboratory where we can live and work and cross pollinate and bring in people with all different views and ideas. And because that's always what's made Burning Man so powerful is that cross pollination. Uh, so my my understanding of sustainability might be a little bit different than other people's. Um, it's almost a little prepper or something, you know. But that's why I'm going really physical right now. We need to generate our own electricity so that we can keep the internet on because that knowledge base is, is going to be uh, increasingly threatened, I think, by the lights going out. So. Yeah, I, I think to me, right, one of the one of my favorite quotes true, is that yeah. if it's not fun, it's it's not sustainable. And uh, you know, I, I think that's one of these kind of moments where you know, especially if we're going to enroll people in in this sustainable future, right? Like there has to be something about it that's aesthetic and and that's beautiful to enroll people in in that dream. Great. Well, Colin, I wanted to ask you a question then, um, you know, because also, you know, like what I like about what I know about you, Colin, too, is, is actually I know you were kind of the first project I ever knew you worked on was in New York City. Um, and, you know, you kind of talked about this this city mm. in, in the desert idea behind seed. So I just wanted to kind of tap into that a little bit more. And, and also, I'm like, mm. as, as, as a, a city person, why are, why are you trying to go out? In, in yeah, there's small, so many interesting trends that have been going on for a little while that 
really the pandemic just kicked into uh, <clears throat> into uh, hyperspeed. Um, so I think there's there's just been all these um, there's been a lot of trends where people are feeling isolated. Rents are really expensive. Um, people are you know existing cities that were designed hundreds of years ago um, are not fulfilling the needs of the people that live in them now. Um, and then then COVID came along and intensified this isolation and really you know we we literally had self isolate and um you know inability to move and stay in your stay in your home shelter in place um that just really intensified this desire for, i think for people to get out and and explore and then we had this enabling we have a number of enabling technologies and all these enabling technologies currently are causing a lot of pain for existing cities so we have things like you know um new transportation networks or, or Uber, Lyft, scooters are kind of stealing rides from mass transit. You know, we all know what happened to libraries. Um, supermarkets are, are now, you know, with all the different delivery uh, platforms out there and, and ghost kitchens and they are, are now kind of making, you know, people aren't even aware where the restaurant is. And now um, if you look at, you know, at, at office buildings and what remote work is enabled, um, simultaneously changing existing cities with so much permanent fixed infrastructure, but it's also enabling new communities to come up. And so the idea of creating a city in the desert, um, you know, if you looked a couple of decades ago, you'd be like, well, what are people gonna do for work? You know, are you gonna build cultural institutions? Are you gonna build school systems? Like, you know, what's, what's your retail corridor plan? All of that is now kind of in the cloud. And so while this can seem really scary for existing cities, I know it's really controversial because we all love cities. I've spent my whole life in various cities and study them and just absolutely love them. But you kind of have to go with, have to look at what some of these trends are doing. And what they're doing is they're enabling us to rethink the way cities are built. And so instead of cities that are built around supermarkets, office buildings, um, and and other things that are no longer relevant in our lives. How about building cities that are built around humans, around the human experience, around um, the tactile qualities of meeting in a public place? You know, I, I love that both these you know cities that uh, Dusty and our team uh, designed don't have cars. They don't have um, you know a lot of hard surfaces. They're very um, intimate. They have gathering spaces. You know, we envisioned a city. We looked at the, the supply chain of a can of peaches or a can of uh, a can of pears um, that you could pick up in the supermarket. And they're grown in Peru. They're put on trucks. They're shipped to a dock. They're put on a boat. They're actually shipped across to Thailand, then shipped back to uh, the United States, then put in a supermarket. Then you buy it, you eat it, and you throw the can away. Um, we envisioned, you know, a, a a city where you could ride your bike on the way to a meeting or a, a, a conference and just pick an apple or a pear off the tree and take a bite out of it. And that's your supply chain. So I think that what's been happening is the complexity of, um, you know, we, cities had to be incredibly complex and focused around this infrastructure. And now that we've built collaboration tools and other systems that are all digital, that the complexity of those digital systems has allowed us to create simpler cities and cities that are getting back to our roots of like, what's a real human experience. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask both of you in, in terms of, uh, it seems like both your projects are on such a scale and of such an intention that you, you've both spent time at Fly Ranch, you've seen what, what is happening there, that will continue to iterate and evolve and expand into the future. So as you approached, the initial design question, um, I'm curious how you took the environmental landscape, what you knew of it had happened, but really we're designing for undefined users of the future and undesigned, undefined activities of the future, um, where, you know, there's some, there's a, an interesting modularity and expandability you sort of have to think about in the openness of your design, say, here's this beautiful place you can do lots of things as opposed to here's a room to do this one thing, which is, I think, an approach to a lot of design now outside of this context for now. 
Um, so let's maybe hear from, from Dusty first about how you approached uh, a space appropriate for whomever and whatever may be to come, which in the world that we know can be uh, quite a wide range. Yeah, I, I think I um, assumed that humans really haven't changed that much in thousands of years. You know, we, we pretty much still have the same motivations, the same interests. We end up tinkering with things, you know, when left to our own devices, we, we tend to uh, follow the same paths. And I think Black Rock City has showed us that, you know, we go out there and it's this tabula rasa of nothing. And, and we create these forms. I mean, we evolve societies uh, the same way after every mass extinction on earth, the same animals re-evolve, that they, there's niches that need to be filled. So the dinosaurs from one era are actually not related to the dinosaurs of another era. They, they evolved separately to fill a niche. And so I, I just figure we're going to, you know, need classrooms, places to learn, places to talk, places to grow food. Uh, and I'm, our project and, and our team hasn't really worried too much yet about exactly where those things are going to happen inside of Coyote Mountain. Uh, we, we really need to get, you know, some engineers involved because none of the three of us are engineers um, that will, you know, tell us, oh, where's the best place for the greenhouse? Where's the best place for the, the uh, solar um, <clears throat> battery uh, grid and, you know, stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, just, um, I'm, I'm just winging it really. <laughs> Thank you. Tom? Um, yeah, I love, uh, something that both our projects had in common, which was just, um, when you imagine a thousand years out, you know, if, if you think, you know, what we're going to be doing, <laughs> if you think what, you know, what we're going to be doing in a hundred years, you're, you're out of your mind if you uh you know so in a thousand years both of our projects disintegrate back into the earth and look like a mountain or a, a sand dune and there's some probably some coyotes jumping on it hunting for some other <laughs> animal um so yeah as dusty said when you're when everything seems to be changing you know you have to design for those fundamental human uh behaviors that that we know about which is the um desire to interact with each other. We think it's really simply ourselves, the planet and each other. And so how can we connect with ourselves to improve ourselves, to be more at peace with ourselves through um, practices like meditation, yoga, um, mindfulness, education, uh, learning, um, you know, how, how can we be more in touch with the earth? So, um, having land set aside for migratory migratory birds or for having like really nature as being a part of your every day. So your, your food is coming out of the ground and your waste is going into the ground. And there's just this constant I mean, you're living in the ground and there's this constant connection and with the earth and as a center for learning about earth centric technologies and practices, you know, this is embedded in everything we do and then connecting with each other, you know, this is, celebration i think you know burning man i think of as a as a just a giant celebration um among other things but uh how can we take that celebration and make it a a sustainable you know it has to be fun but sustainable can't only be fun uh it has to be you know um how can we turn that celebration into something year round where we're um coming together to build to grow food to um you know, have dinners, have parties, have lectures, have uh, giant experiences that we can all share as, as a people. So those are kind of our three tenants that we were designing for. So I want to ask a question that I feel like maybe all three of you would want to answer, or maybe only one of you. And, and if you want to just put up your hand, if you feel inspired, you know, one of the things that I'm thinking about in, in regard to this project and, and actually kind of feeling a little influenced by um, one of our founders from Burning Man, Will Roger, you know, when, when he was starting to enroll me in, in kind of his dream of this Northern Nevada desert is he talked a lot about that playa, 
that uh, we do our temporary city in. And, and he described it as, as very masculine. You know, it, 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 it's very intense. It's hard. It's, you know, you're out there, you're trying to survive, you know, and also in, in, in Black Rock City, it's this like temporary and beautiful, like blooming of an experience for a week and then it's gone. And then as we move, you know, kind of 10, 12 miles over this ridge to, to Fly Ranch, you know, Will really described it as, as feminine. And, and because there's all of this water, there's all of this life, all of these things that unless you've been over that ridge, you would never expect to, to be there. And so I'm, I'm curious, kind of coming from Burning Man culture that again is kind of explosive and temporary, I'm, I'm wondering how the idea of moving into this longer term year round sort of project has, has either influenced you or, or how has it been kind of moving into that longer term vision of design? Dusty. Well, I, I can offer a, uh, an interesting anecdote from the early history of Burning Man uh, that sort of speaks to what Will is probably trying to get at. Um, at first, everybody went out there and it was mostly guys and they brought all this crazy stuff and blew things up and burned things down. And um, they neglected to bring food, <laughs> shelter, place to take a shit. And it wasn't until the women started really coming that, you know, it turned into more of a home. And uh, I don't know if that's... Uh, <laughs> that's the way it, it happened out there. And so maybe this is just sort of the longer term version. You know, we, we've been burning things down and, and blowing things up for some time. And, and boy, is it fun. But if we're going to make a home, we need to um, in, engage the rest of the population in that. Um, there, It's a very, very contrast. There's been... Um, some times during the event cycle when you know Black Rock City, as people you know know it and imagine it, is is going off. Um, and there are times when we have gone from there and we've taken the 12 mile drive to to go to Fly Ranch, property maintenance, or, or other things like that. And it's a very stark contrast visually and experientially, as you mentioned. You sort of go from this uh, borderline cacophonous, very manic, very uh, masculine, uh, very rapid energy. Uh, that fluctuates very quickly to this space that is um, uh, it's it's vibrant and green um, it's it's slow moving and quiet um, there's a there's an abundance of water um, and and it's been really interesting to go from one to the other and see that shift where one is you know the iconic centerpiece is this this wooden man that is built in sort of this 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 release of of chaotic energy um, to the other iconic centerpiece, which is the Fly Geyser on the property, which is this very slow moving uh, rock calcium carbide formation that is slowly evolving over time, that is beautiful and multicolored, that is shaped and created by water. Uh, and those two contrasts I find, uh, that contrast I find very um, telling in the project, but also there is a continuance of energy where I think it's, um, as opposed to being in contradiction to culturally the kinds of things that that Burning Man has been known for, it's a really appropriate complement. And it's and it's a place where a lot of the energies can rest that have been talking about, you know, hey, there's this, there's this other element that is needed to create uh, sustainability on a cultural level. Like you need a place to relax, you need a place to recharge, you need a place to heal, um, to, to engage in, you know, practices like mindfulness that Colin was talking about. Um, and so in that way, ever since the event was held there in, in 97, I feel like there has been, um, a, a, a patient waiting for this complementary environment and set of activities and idea generating project um, to to be established. And so now it's really exciting that we culturally have a, a much wider range of, of possibilities of the kinds of experiences and things that can be offered that is in contrast experientially and environmentally, but then also a, a great complement in terms of community. I just love the, the duality we're seeing, you know, emergence kind of very natural thing. And I, I just see the earth as this through line through both experiences and kind of very literally grounding. And so 
um, a lot of times, you know, what you what you need has been there all along. And so the idea that, you know, um, that these extreme environments, um, you can dig into the earth and uh, find cooling and find something that's also uh, providing warmth in, in the winter and just having this, um, you know, I, I love the idea, as Zach, as you put it, <laughs> the fire on one side and the water on the other and the masculine, the feminine. And then in the middle is this just a continuous and very smoothing effect of, uh, of the, the ground. So it's. All right. So I, I, it looks like we're, we're going to be wrapping up here in, in the next couple minutes. But, you know, a really important question to to ask you know i think the projects in general and then you know zach i think maybe we'll, we'll go to, to laggy and fly you know as a whole is you know part of burning man culture is that sometimes we dream big dreams and we don't exactly know how we're going to pull them off um and and we really got to like put that vision out there and then we enroll individuals and and people who are inspired by that vision along with us so I wanted to ask, you know, what, what are the biggest needs for your projects to, to come into to reality at this time? You know, because I see some people asking about that in the chat. So maybe Dusty, then Colin, and then Zach, you can tell us how to get involved with the Leggy Challenge in general. Engineers, we need engineers. None of our team are engineers, civil engineers, structural engineers. We're going to need an architect of record. Um, probably a couple different architects, landscape architects, um, you know, people that, I mean, first we need to even design the, the drainage, you know, I mean, all that stuff. We're, we're very early in our process. It's really just a artist conception or what they call the schematic, I'm told. Uh, and everything beyond that is, is kind of um, open to interpretation and uh, we're looking for ideas and people that would like to uh, participate in making the mountain a real thing. Yeah, so similarly, um, we're looking for those uh, people to help us build a prototype. So a prototype, I think, is if you've looked at the project, it's kind of this network of, uh, of, build, of earth structures and a large convening hall. Um, we'd really love to start with a single structure and have that be a place where we can bring people together and, and start to prototype this community. Um, so we'll be working with geothermal, we'll be building uh, permaculture uh, gardens and you know, pit-based agriculture or, or some uh, proxy for that. You know, we, we'll, we'll see what, what happens when we get on site, but um, especially um, earth building uh, experts. You know, I think there's a lot of people out there with different techniques, so earth bag, adobe, cob structures, mechanically stabilized earth, you know, uh, earth ship, kind of rammed earth stuff. There's a lot of people with individual expertise in each of these, and we'll, we'll either try and bring them together and see how the different systems work together, but ideally trying to find uh, some expertise who, who is kind of a, a generalist and, and can help us um, not be so dogmatic in a particular discipline, but uh, try, try um, to find out what's exactly right for the land. Yeah, I put my, or I should say our email address in the chat to the right if anybody wants to get in touch, uh, if you uh, have expertise or know someone that you think might be interested in some of those things, uh, shoot us an email. It goes to all of us on our team, coyotes at metamorph-llc.com. Likewise, I drop on in there, Colin at Kibo. Wonderful. And in terms of getting involved in the project, you know, I already mentioned the, the shortlisting page where you can comment or get in contact with any of the teams that have been shortlisted. Two other resources that I'll have is uh, on our website, flyranch.org. There's a newsletter that you can sign up that we send out, volunteer opportunities, just news of what's going on. Or if you want to be able to connect directly with uh, other projects that are going on, on the property, there's quite a, quite a bit of programming that we have. Uh, there is a Fly Ranch Project Facebook group that is a place for people to be used to be able to to connect with each other if, if you're on Facebook. Um, and you know, I just want to end with uh, if you want to get involved in the project, our project is is the process. That is what we define as the scope of our project. And so that is how we do ambitious things and sometimes fail and learn and collaborate. And that is what the project is more than we have a piece of property and we're trying to achieve some particular end state. 
So if you want to get involved uh, in the project, get involved in the process. Uh, any of those links will work. And uh, I want to thank everyone for coming and joining us today. Go big or go home. <laughs> go big or stay home. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for hey, yeah, us. I just. Yeah, I was just going to say, Dusty, Colin, Zach, thank you for, for being here today. You know, I, I I appreciate us all being able to be a part of this conversation because, again, you know, I think sometimes the the airplay that Burning Man gets, right, is is kind of as you were talking about, it's it's the explosion. You know, it's it's the glitz and the glam and it's the LEDs. And I think sometimes it's it's harder for us to speak because you have to experience it, right? Another one of those principles we have is immediacy. And, and when you're there, you, you feel this deeper resonance. And, and I think that part of that deeper resonance that we've all been being pulled into as, as a community is, is really into that landscape and, and into that Northern Nevada community that, you know, for those of us who, who for, if you've only been once, maybe you've just driven through, but I think for those of us who've been now been going for, for years, you know, we, we start to see the magic of, of that northern Nevada landscape, and and I I think I said this before we started the session, but you know these projects and 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 the laggy challenge, you know it's we're, we're just at the start, but things are going to change out there, and and I'm really excited about the change because I think that part of the change is is kind of an inspiration engine for what what is to come. Um, but it, it's also, I don't know, there's also this treasure moment right now, like right before the, the machine turns on. Um, I don't know. I just wanted to call that out because I love that landscape. And, and again, I am so appreciative uh, of all of you for coming on. And uh, I also want to remind, because Zach, I'm just remembering that I think you guys are also doing a larger call with all of the shortlisted proposals on the 19th. Is that right? Indeed, April 19th. Um, either being in that Facebook group, being on our newsletter are great ways to get the Zoom, Facebook Live, live stream links when they're available. Um, we'll be talking to some of the jurors, some of the technical experts, some of the teams, uh, and really announcing next steps of the project, which is really exciting for us. Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate the time today. Thank you. Thanks, Christopher. Thanks, Thanks Zach.